As a breakfast and plus TV Africa, many thanks for being part of the show this morning. We start off with uh, GD Johnson. He joins the conversation uh, via phone or Zoom, if you like to say, this morning. And we're looking at the front pages of a national daily. So we call it Off the Press. GD Johnson, it's good to have you join us. It's a pleasure to be with you, Mercy, and Kofi, and with a couple of our viewers all over the world. Good morning to Live from Akure. Good morning to J.D. Johnson. All right. Boko Haram and Saru terrorists now in Kaduna Erufai cry sound. That's the bold caption for the leadership this morning. Confirms 360 persons killed in Kaduna in three months. Another four students kidnapped in Gidin, Gidan Wire and troops rescue 63 civilians, kill 60 criminals as 1,000. 627 terrorists surrender. Victims' family won against Kaduna train resumption. And uh, you also have quick notice video of Hanese once again on guarded statement. Statutory delegate non assent to amend electoral act will affect primaries. This is what um, the House of Representatives is quoted to say. And after mayhem, FCT minister shorts the Didier Market Electoral Act South Court to hear the suit on whether appointees must resign to contest. I really don't know why this is, you know, a major bone of contention. President Mohammed Buhari inaugurates 200, I beg your pardon, 23 billion naira water project in Bauchi. And Ganduji frustrated me out of APC. Karao is quoted on that, uh, the headlines on the leadership this morning. All right, let's go straight to the next newspaper. This is the Daily Independent. Terrorists now in two local government areas of Kaduna State. Governor El Rufai, bandits kidnap four female students. So look at that more in depth in the first segment uh, on our main discussion. More from the Daily Independent. Despite promotion, Magu's case still on. This is coming from the Minister of Police Affairs. He says he will face prosecution if indicted by the Salami Panel. Interesting. At the top of that front page, Okada ban. June 1 deadline won't stop enforcement. This is coming from the Lagos state government uh, with a rider. Riders police clash. It's no pun intended, but um, of course, they're talking about the clash in Ojo local government area of Lagos state. PDP rejects tenor extension for FCT council chairman and councillors. Uh, decries judgment, vows to drag judge to NJC. PDP rejects tenor to extension for FCT council chairman, councillors. De decries judgment, vows to drag judge to NJC. Buhari signs National Health Authority bill into law, leaves for UAE, and targets 83 million poor Nigerians for coverage. Supreme Court joins Rivers AG speaker in suit against Section 84, Sub 12. This is, of course, uh, the Electoral Act 2022. Tension persists as Abuja traders lament market closure. Police arrest suspected killers of inspector recover arms in Imo. And at the bottom of that front page, I'm vying as Nigerian presidential aspirant not Northern Aspirant. This is coming from Lawan. Those are the headlines on the front page of the Daily Independent. All right, away from the Daily Independent, we take a look at the Punch newspaper this morning. Presidential primaries and certainty over APC PDP delegate list as Buhari delays electoral act. Uh, okay. Nobody has exact number of delegates for presidential primary. Uh, Vaughn DJ is quoted on that, and APC begs INEC for extension. And INEC is still saying, we're not shifting grounds because 3rd of June still remains. The vice president's team denies hotel plan for delegate. And Lagos Airport shot temporarily. Flight diverted over managed or mi I take that again. Lagos Airport shot temporarily, flight diverted over the Mangal Corps on runway, 
and federal government moves to end ASU strike begins a rare payment. Okay. Khan backs Kumuyu's Southeast Crusade acts IPOP to embrace peace. 29 states lack insurance cover for workers. Pencon is quoted on that. You also find we must re-strategize for Nigeria to change, says uh, the former president, Olushagun Obasanjo. And uh, Anambra gunman Sean Soludo's 60-day peace offer continue reign of terror. Planned resumption of train service insensitive, says abductees family. And devolution of powers key to national development. Akirito Lu is quoted on that. 7,256 Nigerian nurses left for the United Kingdom in a year. Uh, this is according to the report. And you still find interesting headlines for, for the want of time. We'll just leave it at that. Let's uh, bring this to a birth with the headlines on the front page of the nation. Uh, the leading one there, pressure on APC governors over tickets for senators' reps. Pressure on APC governors over tickets for senators' reps. AKT 2022, SDP APC disagree over attack on Onis or on Onis. Running mate, SDP APC disagree or attack on Oni's running mate. That's a former uh, governor of uh, AKT State who had to decamp to the SDP. Ex chairman predicts landslide victory for APC. I'll restore last glory in education, says PDP candidate. Interesting. Uh, more from the paper. El Rufai seeks wiping out of communities on Kaduna Abuja Highway. Uh, 360 killed, 1,389 kidnapped in three months. Tinubu to Bauchi, Obochi delegates, you with you, I will win. Tinubu to Bochi delegates with you, I will win. Of course, uh, Minister of Transportation, Roti Miyamichi, uh, who is also presidential aspirant uh, on the platform of the APC, had been there as well. It seems Bochi is um, the toast of the presidential aspirant. Salami's panel, uh, Salami panel's report on Magu stalled two years after. Midi Okada writers are criminals. CP alleges legal steps up ban Enforcement and IPOB to Kumuyi, no crusade is what they're saying. These are some of the headlines on the front page of the nation. We now bring in GD Johnson. GD Johnson, thanks again for your time. Let's begin with um, the Okada issue in the country. We've heard and seen what's been happening in Lagos State. Um, yesterday, we had the clash in Ojo between the law enforcement authorities and, of course, the Okada men. We can also look at what is happening or what happened at the day day market in Abuja, the building materials market, where there was a clash between the traders and motorcycle operators, commercial motorcycle operators. Are these motorcycle operators becoming um, a security threat or have they become a security threat as a group to the country? Well, um, if you check the source of the means of mobility, for terrorists operating in the northeast and in the north central and in the northwestern part of Nigeria, we discover that that's their means of mobility. What those one that you know what they used to cut away the rice they demanded for and some of the food items they demanded for. For anyone that cares to listen, it's just that our leaders are far away from reality and then there is there is a racket that is that's ongoing with this process with respect to revenue generation, either by state-appointed agents or state-recognized agents from these Okada riders. And that's why you see them in droves. Don't need anyone to tell you. For example, I've lived in my own community for more than 40 years. Here I lived. The Okada, the Okada Park has been taken over by people that are not Nigerians. I've said it. I've said this, I've said this on, on programs, on live programs many times. So it's... It is there for everybody to see that um, the, the the threat is 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 is, is there. Is there? It's just we are sitting on the keg of gunpowder which we are pointed at. You see the result with which these people um, um, reacted to this to this ban, and then you see the political move with the governor of Lagos taking promised massive votes if if the ban is overturned. And in the democracy, game of number, 
But we are a nation that does not enforce this law. There are rules that govern immigration. Most of these people riding this back are not even Nigerians. Are not even Nigerians. They are Chadians, Nigerians, and the rest. And the rest of it. We have said it that look, considering the cosmopolitan nature of Lagos and considering the nature of our roads, and that there is a way in which we go about regularizing and registering those that are into that trade. For example, we could, reg we could register them at the riders. At, at the local government, because let's be let's face reality, our public transport system can handle the volume of commuters that we have in Lagos. It can't. It can't. Government must come up with a structure, a structure in which that these people are registered. They are legitimately registered. There can be contact tracing. Not that somebody will just sit somewhere and we 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 will import people from the J from Chad and will bring them to different parts of this country, and then all you just do is to keep them a bike, and they ride the bike, and they deliver to it. It's the same thing with people that that collect arms on the street. But we wait to see how government will enforce its law with, with respect with respect to that. They have overwhelmed all parks. All you need to do is to send your cameraman and, and a reporter to go around and do uh, uh, and, in, and do a survey around and look at the nationality of these are riders. I can tell you for a fact, and I can give you evidences from different parts that can be verified from different parts that have been overwhelmed. Fagba Junction in the Fakoja local government, Balopun Junction in the Fakoja local government in Lagos State, Ishaga, Ishaga Badu Junction in the Fakoja local I've given you just three parts. I'm giving you just that you can go right as I'm talking to you. And you check the nationality of the people, and they all spread around. Uh, but but Jimmy Johnson, I, I, I've heard I've heard this narrative over and over and over again, especially uh, on the radio where I also have a program. Um, and I've asked those who come up with this, saying that most or majority of the bike men, the Okada riders we see in Lagos State, are not Nigerians. Where is your proof? Did you go around to conduct? Uh, a research, you know, did you go around to gather data? Did you have a sample size? You're a lecturer, so you understand the methodology for coming up with such uh, uh, um, conclusions. Are we sure we're not, you know, we're not, we're not guessing or conjecturing here? The most powerful tool of data gathering, of gathering evidence. Now, when you interpret your data, it turns to evidence. The most powerful tool that God has given to man, the most potent research tool, is observation. Is observation. That's one. That's why when you give back to a kid, a kid does not put the food in his nose. The kid puts the food in his mouth because he has, he has observed and see that people around him are putting food in their mouth and not in their nose or in their eyes. Now, that's one of the major, in fact, the primary tool of journalism is observation. The primary tool of knowledge acquisition is observation. Two, like you said, is survey. And I've given you three locations. Three locations in terms of field study. Three, is my own personal experience. I don't, most people drive all the time. I don't drive all the time. Sometimes I take bike and I ask my son to bring the car to school because I want to know what is happening in my environment. As a researcher, as a journalist, I want to know what is happening in my environment. So I take private buses sometimes, I take NAPEP sometimes, and I take and I take bike sometimes. In actual sense, when I'm driving to school and the traffic is heavy, I, I park the car and I take bike and I ask my son to bring the car or I leave the car at home. So I'm talking from experiential point of view. Mm. So I'm, I'm sure what I'm talking about. They are not Nigerians. You can send your reporter. All right, let, let, if, Gina Johnson, if you let's move away can, from listen, this discussion. If you, want us to go, you can send me one of your reporters and I'll take your reporter out. I'll drive. I'll personally drive the reporter. G.D. Johnson, uh, let's, let, let's quickly move away from this and, and look at all the issues on the front pages of a national dailies. I mean, on the leadership newspaper, it talks about uh, the governor of Kaduna State, Nasir Erufai, uh, confirming the presence of 
terrorist and, uh, you know, the Ansaru uh, terrorizing the entire place and being when responsible for... When he was busy rewarding, when he was busy rewarding criminality, negotiating with bandits, when bandits were terrorizing Southern Kaduna, everything was politicized for political goal. Now, you have raised a Frankenstein monster and it has become... You have raised a monster that has turned to a Frankenstein monster and it's, it has become a major problem for you. It's, it's, it's clear. It's clear prior to 2019 election that we see governors in, this, in the northwest part of the country going into the forest to negotiate with... It's only in Nigeria that you reward criminality. Now, the government is crying out now that two local governments have been taken over by terrorists in the state, by the Ansaro terrorists. In the northeast, you have Boko Haram. In the northwest and part of North Central, which is Niger, you have, you have these Ansaro terrorists. Because over time, state agents have negotiated with non-state actors. And you have emboldened them. And it, it, it seems that it pays more to be it pays to commit crime than to, 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 to respect law in, in, in Nigeria. You see the quickness with which the police will react to arrest, prosecute people for minor infractions. But here you see people committing crime against the state and yet, yet they are being rewarded. So it's nothing new and it's nothing surprise to me that terrorists have taken over Two, two states. It's only two states. The government is just economical with truth. There are two local governments in the, in, 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 in Kaduna state. What about Niger state? What about what we have in, 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 in Zamfara state? And that's, that's an impeachable that's an impeachable offense. It's an impeachable offense because every every government at every level promised to protect the territorial integrity of the nation one, which there have been major infraction, two, to protect lives and property of its citizenry. Failure to do that, that government at whatever level. Hmm. We seem to be having a disconnect with uh, G.D. Johnson, but as soon as we're able to establish contact uh, with him, uh, we continue with sharing his thoughts as the breakfast on Plus CV Africa. We're looking at the front pages of a national dailies. I mean, uh, very interesting headlines. Uh, if you ask me on the day list this morning, from the fact that you have the Kaduna State uh, Governor crying out about terrorists occupying some local government in the state, and uh, you know, to other issues of the Okada clash, and to also the e issues of the APC and the PDP, uh, of course, uh, the APC to be precise, asking for a shift of time for the timetable. Kofi, let, let, let's also look at that particular one. Uh, we've also spoken with uh, Festus Okoye, who has also stated that, you know, INEC is very stable at this point in time. I mean, very static with the situation, very, very uh, decisive, saying that they're not shifting grounds as regards um, adjusting the timetable for primaries for political parties. Absolutely, absolutely. But I, I'm told we have Jerry Johnson back on, on, on Zoom. Uh, Jerry Johnson, are, are you there with us, please? Yes, I'm with you. All right, I'm going all right. to the primaries, which my series that I've been with you for a while. Okay. Well, um, I love the reserve. Of, I I love the reserve of INEC, and let the parties be careful, because if judging from what INEC did in 2019, we could see that there is a determination on the part of INEC to ensure that they do things according to the rules. Now, INEC did not make the law. It is the National Assembly that has membership from PDP and APC, the ruling party APC, and the opposition party, PDP. And to my knowledge, this is one of the electoral act that we have that is progressive in nature too, that is more consultative, that involves a lot of stakeholders, that a lot of things were put in it before we have this. Recall that the last electoral act we had was in 2011. That's 11 years ago. So the parties themselves, we want to truncate the process. And I love the result of INEC. Let the parties, whether they like, let them comply, let them not comply. 
All right. The, the, it is very, very clear. In Zafara State, APC did not have candidate. In in River State, they did not have candidate. And so let any party fail to abide by the rules. Okay. And then they will forfeit the right. opportunity of party. Johnson, in, interestingly, you've landed on, on the, um, the electoral act. So let's stay there. Uh, on the front page of the Punch newspaper, it's, it's, it's focusing on presidential primaries, which will come to uh, a conclusion on June 3. That's the deadline, like Messi has said, and you've also commented on, and it ain't shifting ground. Um, but the paper is saying there is uncertainty over the APC and PDP delegates list uh, because the president has delayed uh, signing the Electoral Act. And you know that uh, a small matter of whether those occupying po elected positions are allowed to be uh, delegates uh, to vote um, at the uh, the party primary. Said so the president has received the the bill passed by the amendment passed by the National Assembly, but is not signing it. Even still, with this electoral act, they had the Supreme Court regarding Section eighty four, subsection twelve, right in the middle of the electioneering season. What's going on? Now, why, why do we need why do we need contention over Section eighty four, subsection twelve? It's very clear. You can't be appointed and be using state resources to run your campaign. That is very clear, and I'm sure the Supreme Court we we agree with the appellate court because the appellate court has ruled that um, that's a, that's subsection states, and I think the Supreme Court we agree with that. Now, let's leave that on the issue of. Uh, the, the, the amendment that was done by the National Assembly with respect to, you know, we spoke about it, um, I think last week, about the super delegate. Elected representative under normal, that's the norm. There are some things that are not needed to be. It's not every rule you write. That's the norm. They are super delegate because, one, they've tested waters. The people have elected them compared to the party delegates who are elected by party members. These as of rep members, as of assembly members, the president and the vice president, they've been elected by the people. These are actually the true representative of the people. Why should, why should a senator and a house of rep member and house of assembly member should not be, a local government chairman should not be part and parcel of the national convention of their party in picking their primaries? I think we don't need any debate concerning that. The party should go ahead. And release the and include them in their delegates and let the court decide whether he both parties. That's what we call it. Is not everything the court will rule on. There's what we call political solution. This is what is required by political solution. For example, in 3P and APC, the interparty, uh, what the interparty, the IPAC, the interparty advisory council. If they all come together and say, you know what, we are going to include all this as part of our delegates. Is there is clear in the constitution of the party? But 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 Julia Johnson, you you're talking about a political solution. You have rightly reminded us of the fiasco um, that the 2019 election was for the APC in Zamfara State and in River State. Um, would any political party who goes contrary to this this law, you know, the amended law um, that that does not allow statutory delegates, like you've called them, super delegates, to vote uh, to be delegates at the, the primaries, wouldn't they be setting themselves up if they go against the the law as it as it has been passed, you know, for for a repeat of two thousand and nineteen? What 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 guides the party, the electoral act, or their party constitution in picking their candidates? What guides the party? In the first instance, we have said it that the National Assembly had no business legislating over this. In actual sense. That particular section should be expunged completely. I said it last week because we reviewed it. What guides the party? Without the party, there won't be the National Assembly because it is the party that sponsors candidates to go to the National Assembly. So there are rules that govern party. Parties have their constitution. And if that happens, the party can approach the court, and I'm sure the court will rule in favor of the party. Hmm. Because it is the party that select candidates. A, a quick, a quick, a quick one on this. Yes, Julie, are, are we not seeing? This yeah. are norm. Julie there Johnson, are, no are we not that, seeing? That are not debatable. Yeah, are we not seeing? It is not because, yeah, are we not seeing yeah, the yeah, National yeah. Assembly get away easily? Because it seems the focus has not been on them. If you remember some months ago, this was seen as the the the, the, the um, electoral act was seen as 
uh, a way for the National Assembly to uh, members to stand up to the governors who called the shots as to who among them we can return, you know, to either the Green Chamber or the Red Chamber. We're not seeing that play out again in some of these these um, acts or these clauses that have been inserted into, is this a ploy or a way by, uh, by, by the National Assembly members to, to, to control their political destiny? Now, let me let, me let you know this. Even if um, you could see in one of the stories, I don't know which newspaper it is, um, we had that reps and for the Senate and reps ticket, they are pressure on governors, particularly APC governors, for the ticket. Look, the most powerful block in Nigerian political landscape since 1999 are the governors. We said it. They control the party. They control the National Assembly. They are, they are key members of the Federal Executive Council. You know how many former governors are in the Federal Executive Council? You know how many former governors are in the Senate? Do you know how many governors that are going back to the Senate? Now again, do you know even the wife of governors that are contesting? At least the wife of governor, former governor of Baker State, is a three-term senator, still currently ongoing. The wife of the governor of Ondo State, where I'm presently, is, is contesting in Imo State. So it's the, the, the structure of the party and the nature of that of governors that we have, the governors are powerful. So there's nothing anybody can do about that. But there are super delegates, elected representatives of the people. We should get the list of the delegates elected at the conventions of the party. That, that there's no contention about that. That's the reason why they are delegates. The essence of those national delegates is for them to participate in national convention, either to elect national executive of the party or <clears throat> to elect the flag bearers of their party at national elections. And that's what it's all about. But as with respect to how parties conduct themselves, you can't expect, it's just like legislating to say that all parties must run the same way. APC must be run the way PDP. Parties operate based on their own ideology. And everybody has an ideology. It is that ideology that shapes their constitution. And their constitution is what guides their internal arrangement. So okay. the National Assembly cannot legislate. It's, it is it is an overkill. It is outside the oversight responsibility of the National Assembly or the INEC to legislate on our party and govern themselves. What INEC will do is that the party will submit their constitution. And what INEC needs to do is that are you abiding by the rules of your constitution? But in Nigeria, we want to legislate about everything. It is not everything you can legislate on. There are some norms, there are some principles, and there are some values that govern party system. Okay, um, G.D. Johnson, let's also look at the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Despite promotion, a Magus case still on. That's what the police minister is quoted to say. Uh, says he will face prosecution if indicted by the Salami panel. Now, this is actually, I mean, we're talking about this because Simai Kerr was indicted with, uh, you know, the issues of, uh, you know, fraud and funds involved at the end of the day. And this also got a lot of people talking about the promotion of Mago. But what do you make of this case? They are saying that he's not even, uh, you know, there's no immunity against his persecution. Uh, in this case, that the case is not finished, but you still have him in the system. What does this really mean? I've never worked in the civil service, but I'm aware of some certain things that guide civil service. I am not too knowledgeable about that, but I'm, I'm aware of some certain one, once you're under investigation, you cannot be promoted. You cannot be promoted. Someone is under investigation, a panel has been set up to look into it, and you're promoting the person. Why are they in order to promote the person? If eventually is vindicated, then you can do this double promotion or triple promotion. We've seen cases of people getting triple and double promotion in the civil service. But you know, like I said, we, we take 10 steps forward and we take 100 steps backward. What justification, what moral justification does the police service, um, what have you, have to promote it now? To prove what? Because the matter is still being investigated. Do you reward someone that has been accused of an infraction? That's, 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 my, that's my view on, on, on that. I don't think that um, the, the, government, the, the police service commission should have done what they have done. They should have waited until 
the final report is written, and if Margo is vindicated, then he will be promoted accordingly. And all these, we have seen situations where five people are promoted probably five years after, and all the areas are paid. So there, there's nothing new, but why are they in the hurry? I don't know. I don't know. No, but, but if you're know. saying that, you know, the case is not finished, I mean, there's no immunity uh, against his prosecution, that means that even with the fact that um, he's been promoted or he's still part of the system, anything can still happen. I mean, you know, justice can still have his way. Well, um, justice will surely have his way. Justice will surely have his way. No doubt about that. Justice will surely have his way. But the most important thing is that what signal are we sending? Are we fighting corruption? Or are we encouraging corruption? Or are we embedding corruption in the system? Someone has been accused of corruption. Someone has, and then what we need to do, what we need to do is, is to, is to ensure that we send the right signal to people. We send it, we communicate appropriately to people that government is serious about dealing with issues that has to do with financial impropriety. Now, if the person that headed the agency has been accused of that, and then you are promoting the person, what, what signal are you sending to the rank and file of the EFCC, to the rank and file of security agencies? It means that you can commit a crime, you can be accused of a crime, and yet you can still be, be, be promoted. I don't think it's good for the service, and I don't think it's good for the nation, and I don't think it's good for the optics. All right. Julia Johnson, let, let, let's go over to uh, the southeastern uh, states of Nigeria. Um, uh, the point you suppress dedicated some of uh, some space on its front page to talk about the southeast. You have um, IPOB on one hand. You have the enforcers of the Monday sit at home or so-called unknown gunmen. On the other hand, you have Charles Soludo in the picture. You have uh, W.F. Kumi, believe it or not. He's also in the picture as well. Uh, wonders shall never end. But let's start with Solodo's approach to um, the violence in Anambra State. Um, he began his his uh, his tenure as governor uh, with um, a, a hard stance. You know, he he declared unilaterally declared an end to the Monday sit at home, uh, a sit at home that he did not start, but he declared that it was over. And, um, you know, gave a, sort of an ultimatum to uh, gunmen to come out, else they will be dealt with. And we, we know what happened. Carnage and terror uh, was, was increased in a number of states. Even the governor's own local government council, his home local government council, was not scared. They attacked the building and they burned stuff there. Um, he went to visit the IPOB leader, Namdi Kanu, in DSS detention now. He has given a 60-day peace offer to the gunmen in Anambra State, a change of, of tactic, you might call it. But the headline on the front page of the punch is that the Anambra gunmen have shunned Soledo's 60-day peace offer, offer and they are continuing their reign of terror. terror. What are your thoughts on this? Well, um, it's very important for all stakeholders, political, traditional, religious, and traditional institutions from the Southeast to come together to address this problem. This was how Boko Haram started in the North, in the Northeast, and we could see how it has developed and what it has developed into. It has developed into a frequency monster that cannot be contained. I think that for the good of the Southeast, there must be a stakeholders meeting. What do they want? How do we approach this issue? What is the goal? If you ask people, if you are fighting Nigeria and you are telling people in your region <clears throat> not to go about their business on a certain day, you are only hurting yourself. You are only hurting yourself because it is your people that are actually affected. And I think that that's the need for that critical stakeholders meeting is important. But what we have seen is that all the Southeast governors they are working independent of one another. There's no common voice amongst them. And this is the time that the people from the East need to drop their Republican posture and adopt a communal posture, a communal posture in which all of them will come together and talk about how to address this particular issue. We have it in Imo State. We have it in Anambra State. 
now. It's just a matter of time. It might spread to Enugu. If the governor of Enugu thinks it's not, I'm not affected, or the governor of Ebony thinks I'm not affected, or the governor of Abia Abia thinks I'm not affected, it's just a matter of time. So it is important for all these critical stakeholders, and it's important to appeal to these people that are perpetrating this candidate to understand that if they destroy that community, if they destroy that state, if they destroy that southeast, what legacy do they want to leave for their children? Is that the legacy their father has left for them? Because it's important for us to point this out. I don't think there's a need for us to solve any problem by violence. Even the ones that you have war, World War One, World War Two, were resolved on on the on, on, on a table. Everything will be resolved and be kept. But, 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 but so why yeah, don't they embrace the yeah, peace yeah. fact that the governor has thrown at them? And I think that the governor really wants things to work. And I think that the, the federal government to, should join and work hand in hand with the governor of Anambra State to find a solution to this problem. All right, Julie Johnson, um, um, IPOB has, has released a statement um, uh, urging the military to go after these, uh, these, these so-called unknown gunmen, uh, which to some people may be a surprise because uh, before now, IPOB and the military were like cat and, and mouse. Um, also, the, the leader, uh, the general of the CIA, if you want to call it that, of the Deeper Life Christian or Deeper Christian Life Ministries has been warned against holding his crusade uh, in, in the southeast. Um, and IPOB is saying, see, we don't want anyone to be attacked or to be killed by gunmen. If you're killed by gunmen, you will now come and say that it's IPOB when we, when we know nothing about this. Has IPOB, are they, are they reaping in the southeast? Are they reaping the fruit that they planted? Because I remember that people, you know, not a few people said, hey, this thing you're doing, be careful about tomorrow. Um, you might start to rear, or you might rear a monster that you not, might not be able to tame in the future. So should the people of the Southeast be reflecting on what they started that has now you know, snowballed into an untamed monster? Can you see, we started from Kaduna, where the government governors was negotiating and paying bandits. And today, the governor is crying that two local government has been taken over by terrorists. For the first time, he called them terrorists. Now, the issue of the Southeast, we pointed this out, that there are different tactics, that guerrilla warfare does not work in the 21st century. There are better ways and better ways of resolving issues, of solving problems. So we have pointed this out over time. So as a result of that, we have seen what it has turned into. IPOB as an agenda, and some other people without that nefarious criminal intention have taken over what have taken off from where IPOB stopped from. So uh, I think it is appropriate and it's right for them to call to partner with the federal government to deal with this this Frankenstein monster that must be curtailed before it destroys the rule of Southeast. And that's the reality. And that's is 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 also important for the political class as we are going towards 2020 to understand that the people they recruit for their political aspirations, if they are not properly taken care of, they become a menace to the society. All right, um, Jide Johnson, let's also take a look at the Punch newspaper this morning. It talks about the fact that um, uh, families and friends of passengers abducted from the Abuja Kaduna uh, train are saying that um, they're not pleased and are asking that the service should not resume because of uh, the experience and demanding that if there should be resumption, then those who are in captivity of terrorists should have been released. But we can also ignore the fact that, I mean, the federal government had said that they spent 1.7 billion naira per kilometer for that construction. And uh, to some extent, we're very indebted well, um, the, it's unfortunate that we gloss over the loss of lives and people that have been abducted and not been released. And then what we'll be interested in is the resumption of, of, um, of activities by the Nigerian Railway Corporation for the Katna Abuja, Abuja line. It's unfortunate that we won't be discussing that. Just imagine the outrage it will happen, <coughs> that will happen. If this had 
happened in the United States of America, in London, in Australia, or even in South Africa down here. I don't understand. Um, is it the commercial activity and the revenue that comes from it, from it that the government is much more interested in? Or is it about the protection of lives and property of an average Nigerian? What measure has government put in place? There was no press conference. By, by the, there was no statement. Um, there was nothing from the president. From the not, nothing from the president. I mean, the president himself. I'm not talking about his kids. From the president, with respect to that, it's nothing. But if something happened, if that had happened to some people in Ghana, our president would have visited Ghana. or must have said something about Ghana. If that happened in Mali, our president would have said something. But where it happened in Nigeria, we gloss over it, and then we think life will return to normal. And because Nigeria have the capacity to absorb whatever comes their way, uh, for me, it's, it's insensitive of government to talk about resumption of activities on that railway line without dealing with the issue of those that were kidnapped, those that were abducted, and those that have been killed. And what compensation are we giving to those families? They, you know, in, 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 <clears throat> if the families, if they are well organized, they should organize themselves and take Nigerian Railway Corporation to court and take the Ministry of Transportation to court and take the federal government to court. It might take them years, but I'm sure they will get compensation for government failure to secure their lives. Now you are operating, you have a government transportation system and the people enter into a government transportation system and their lives and property could not be secured. They should sue the government. Government is an entity that can be sued. <coughs> Excuse me. So they should, they should they should band together and sue the government, sue the government at various levels. Cardinal state government, um, federal government, Ministry of Transportation, you join them, you get a good lawyer. It might take you years, you get compensation at the end of the day. Okay, but if that's the case, I mean, it's not that we're having it differently with the roads because, I mean, shortly after, you know, this announcement of uh, the train service being... Um, you know, there's a plan to resume, resume the train service. You also have the attack on the roads. Should we also, um, you know, I tell you, about that? Should I tell you? Should, should I, I, start... I've said it that every accident that happened in Nigeria would have said it that we should sue Ministry of Ministry of Ministry of Works because some of the nature of the roads are terrible. And then if it's within the state, you sue the state government. Because we elect people into public office and they are they appoint people to to superintend over some of the government activities and we pay our taxes. I tell you, I've no, I didn't see it in any picture of these people. A truck of a major organization killed ten people as I was traveling to Accra. Ten. Ten. Not was told. And I told those that care to listen that you won't see this on the pages of newspaper. It won't be reported by any media organization. What is the value of an average Nigerian life? Ten is a major, a major organization that has been reputed for their trailers killing. In natural sense, their trailer killed some student in 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 Ondo State in Akumba. You know what I'm talking about. All right. Ten uh, yesterday. Uh, uh, inter interesting, yeah, uh, uh, Jenny Johnson. But um, 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 when a major organization has its uh, trailers, and I, I I think I know the organization you're talking about. Um, if you look at, at, at the history, they bought these trailers and gave it out on a sort of a higher purchase agreement to these drivers who drive roughly, you know, and, and, and the organization may not be able to control these people who drive. Trailers, trailer drivers all over Nigeria. Jillian tra Johnson, trailer yeah, drivers yeah. all over Nigeria drive, mean, drive as, no, no, as, no, no, as if they're on, on Formula yeah, One, okay. you know, a truck. Now, just imagine if you list out a truck to somebody in United States, and then that truck, and then your organization has developed a reputation of killing people. You know what? Let me tell you what my 19-year-old son said. Let me tell you from, from the thinking of a 19-year-old son. Is there is there a block connection between the money? Is this no money ritual? That's what that's the first year because I don't mean to 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 downplay the importance of, of, of life. It's it's a sad one. And indeed you're right uh, when you say uh, that the uh, trailers have is, a notoriety. Is, but Jenny Johnson, the the question I'm asking is is, is, is it about one life? 
It's sacred. Yeah, no, Jire, Jire, the question I'm asking. One life, yeah, Jire, Jire, the question. The of Nigerian life. Yeah, Jire, the question I'm asking is is it about the this organization in, in question, you know, unnamed organization, or is it about the way our uh, trailer uh, and, and about, truck drivers it's about, drive? It's about, the name, it's, about the, it's about your name organization. It's about the nature of our road. It's about, look, you see, you have what is called Federal Road Safety Corporation. Federal Road Safety. They are not about Federal Road Safety. It's about Federal Revenue, Federal Revenue Commission. Because the way they stop you, you can send your camera. In actual sense, when I'm talking about, I'll do a recording myself. Now, it's not about safety. It's, 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 it's about revenue. That's what it's all about. Then you also look at the, the type of roads they construct, and you see the millions of naira that are being collected to construct those roads. Why do we have government in place when government could not provide basic infrastructure? What I'm saying in fact is that you can sue government at every level for anything. And that's what I'm saying. And until we develop to the point that citizens can file cases, I can't recall the name, can file cases against the state and sue the state for the failure of the state to do what the state ought to do, our okay. public officials elected and appointed will not wake up with their responsibility. And that's the reality. Right. That is a happy lot. Okay, should I tell you another one? Should I tell you another one? Now, as we are approaching our work, another trailer killed an Okada, destroyed, destroyed them. You will see it on the pages of the newspaper. No media will report it. Is, is this the same? Is, it, is this from, is this from the same listen, organization? I'm talking about between Ijebuote. Listen yeah. to me, please. I'm talking about between Ijebuote and and Ore, about 184 or 198 kilometers of road. You have you have over close to about 20 Nigerians losing their life just yesterday. Is this is this second uh, accident uh, unfortunate as it is from the a trailer uh, a truck? Owned by the same organization in question? Different, different okay. organizations. Right. It, it's unfortunate, really different sad, different. really sad one. Different organizations. Right. Really now, one. what I'm saying in effect is that now if you have federal road safety that ensure compliance with how trucks should move, with the speed trucks you maintain, you have this. That's where the federal, that's where the government aspect comes to it. Then if you have a timeline with which trucks can move, and then you have tracks. With which truck? Okay, all trucks must keep the right. All trucks must be on the right. right. GD Johnson, thank you so much for seat. being part of the uh, show this morning. We have to let you go at this point in time. We appreciate your thoughts as always. GD Johnson is the Chief Lecturer in Nigeria and Institute of Journalism. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's the size of, of the press. We will definitely return on Monday with interesting headlines. Uh, generating different reactions in different spaces and also bringing you uh, in-depth analysis. We'll take a break now. When we return, the breakfast continues. Stay with us.